Welcome to Genealogy Hangout and this week we have a special guest, very special guest, Dave Robertson. Hi Dave, how are you? I'm just fine, I'm just fine Fiona, thank you for having me. Oh that's perfect, uh, not a problem. And for anyone watching who hasn't seen me before, hi, my name's Fiona Tallison and I'm the uh, founder of Genealogy Hangout and hopefully this is a regular occurrence. Uh, we didn't happened last week and I do apologise but we're going to make up for it this week and Dave is a professional genealogist and he comes from America, I'm in Australia and um, he's got quite a bit to say so uh, we do have guests in the strip below and um, Chris, hi, how are you? And uh, well, Chris is that's good. Um, we're going to come back and talk to Chris in a little while. We're going to let Dave uh, introduce himself and talk about um, firstly how he became a professional genealogist and also what he actually does now that he is a professional genealogist. So Dave, welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Fiona. And I, uh, as I was telling you earlier, uh, I have absolutely nothing prepared. So everyone's going to get it r right and raw. And you said we can tape for eight hours? So everybody ought to get a, something to drink and sit back and, <laughs> well, anyway, as Fiona said, my name is Dave Robinson or Robertson or Robinson or Robson, however you want to spell my last name. You know, that's the first rule in genealogy is that spelling doesn't count. And I certainly discovered that. And I'll tell you why I don't pronounce it Robinson as my dad used to. I was indignant as a teenager that people thought my name was Robinson. And I was also a student in a French uh, French school and the French Canadian nuns called me David Robison so I thought that if I started calling myself David Robison that that would distinguish me from Robinson it didn't work but it did help me in my research years later um, in trying to find some of my ancestors I guess I'll begin the story with uh, the fact that my parents both of them and for a variety of reasons uh, used to tell my sister and I what you don't know won't hurt you and we lived next door to my grandmother and uh, her uh, and my two aunts the, who, who um, have since all passed away. But uh, we lived in a duplex and that was my family, you know, as far as I knew. We, I had an uncle who would come by once in a while and he uh, ultimately they had five children. So I had five cousins. To me, that was it. And never had an interest in going beyond that. But uh, uh, it got to a point where... Um, uh, I think I was in high school and I got a letter from a fellow from Alabama and he sent me this two-page letter it typewritten and turns out it was a genealogy of my family my father's side that I knew absolutely nothing about and I think I was 16 and I was in awe of the data that was on this thing I actually knew the name of a grandparent a great-grandparent who was born in get ready for this 1869 Oh my God. So I was so impressed with this letter that I folded up and put it away and didn't look at it for probably another 20 years. But that's the piece of paper that I did start with uh, after my um, uh, some turmoil in my life, which isn't important, but I, but I said, uh, I've got to do some things that are interesting to me, not just to do things that, uh, for everybody else all the time, but still, um, I still love helping people, teaching people, uh, helping them get through their roadblocks or their brick walls, and I love the smile on their face or the or the <gasps> when they find something that they never knew was out there. So in 1990 something, I went to a a, a store and bought Family Tree Maker software, and that's where the whole electronic piece got me started. And I started building a pedigree chart and I started looking for documents and I started looking for all sorts of things and of course I was nowhere near a professional at the time so shame on me I've got lots of information out there that is unsourced um, so I'm, I'm trying to bring myself to the point of rebuilding that whole family tree and doing it uh, the way I teach people to do it now uh, but I'm like the cobbler with no shoes I, I do everything for everybody else and I rarely have time to do uh, work for myself actually um, but I've still managed to collect about 39,000 individuals going all the way back to um, well at least in this country but everybody knows about the Mayflower 
and uh, I've got some Mayflower and Mayflower ancestor, and I've got some that showed up the year after, and then a few years after that. So on my mother's side, I've got family that uh, goes back to the colonies. On my father's side, um, Scots Irish that showed up in this country or in these colonies uh, in the mid 1700s, and uh, you know, b both sides of the family. The, no, no one was wealthy. No one was uh, you know high up in the government. Uh, they were all mostly farmers. And uh, farmers, as you probably realize, have large families. So I have thousands and thousands of individuals in this database. So to get back to my letter, um, uh, it was from a fellow named Dave Sanders, David Sanders, and he turns out he's a second cousin of mine. And uh, uh, I, I got I, I got in touch with the place where my dad was born, which was in Evergreen, Alabama. Now, I live up in Massachusetts, and Evergreen, Alabama is about 15 or 1,600 miles from here south. And I contacted the Evergreen uh, Library and asked them if they had any way that I could get some genealogy on my dad uh, as he was born and was raised in Evergreen. And they said to me, well, geez, you need to get in touch with Mrs. Coker, Mrs. Sarah Coker, and uh, She's been doing genealogy down here in the in, in the county for for years and years and years, so they gave me her address and I sat down and I wrote a very nice letter, uh, dear Mrs. Coker and blah blah blah, uh, and signed it and fired it off to Mrs. Coker. Well, she sent me back a letter explaining that she's my second great aunt, and uh, she knew me since I was born. I didn't know her from as she would put it. I didn't know her from Adam's house cat. But I, a few couple years after that, I uh, went down to a family reunion, and I also went over and uh, uh, spent some time with her. She was in her late 80s when I, when I did meet her, and it turns out she's my grandfather's youngest sister, and she had piles and piles and piles of research and never touched a computer. She did everything through letters and applications and driving to places, but she had a pile of, of, of uh, research. So I was able to put my my dad's side of the family, my father's side of the family, I was able to put that together very, very well, thanks to Aunt Sarah. And I learned that I have uh, not only Civil War veterans, but uh, War of 1812 veterans and Revolutionary War veterans um, in my background. And again, no one was a... No one was a general or a commanding officer or anything. They were, they were all, um, um, you know, privates or colonels or something. But at any rate... Um, uh, the family reunion was was a fantastic experience because here I am, uh, a fellow that grew up next door to his grandmother and his two aunts. I'm surrounded with 300 people from all over the United States that are that and they're all related to me. And I thought that that was very 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 special. So um, fast forward a couple of more years, and I started to get people to. Uh, ask me, well, do you think you can find this person for, for me, or my grandfather this, or my great grandmother that? And so I started doing some research for friends um, and just putting some things together. Um, a, a, a friend of mine called me in 2008, I think it was, and he said, Would you do me a favor? Could you call this attorney out near Boston and just tell him that you're uh, my brother in law? And uh, and he's going to ask you some questions. I said, well, uh, questions about what? He says, no, I'm not going to tell you. He says, right. He said, I'd rather have you go into it cold, but he will tell you what he's looking for. So I said, okay, fine. I got the attorney on the phone, and he said, uh, I understand you're the family historian. I said, well, uh, yeah, I'm the family historian. <laughs> I didn't know I had that honor, but I did all of a sudden. He said, do you have this particular guy? I think the name at the time was Edward A. West. Um, oh, sure, I've got his birth certificate right here. When was he born? And I told him. He said, okay, that checks out. Was he ever married? And I said, oh, I got his marriage certificate right here. He was married to so-and-so. Oh, perfect, that checks out. I said, well, what's this all about? He said, well, I have one more question for you. How many children did they have? I said, well, oddly enough, they only had one daughter, and her name was Phyllis, and she was born in 1932. He said, well, that cinches it. You're the family I'm looking for. I said, what did we do? He said... <laughs> He said, uh, well, I'm sorry to tell you that Phyllis died last week, and she didn't have a will. So I've been looking for her family because I have an estate worth about $170,000, and we'll put the paperwork together and assign an executor, and 
you'll be able to collect the money. Well, I wasn't going to collect it. My friend was going to collect it. But that's my big money story. I never found a fortune for myself. But um, uh, John, of course, was pretty happy that I was able to get everything together, that all the things that he needed to collect this $170,000. And there's much more to the story, but we only have eight hours tonight, right, Fiona? So I won't go too far into the story. But um, I started teaching classes um, uh, not too long after that. Uh, our church was looking for fundraising activities, and they do a pretty good job of having quilt sales and rummage sales and, and uh, dinners and all the rest of it. And I just spontaneously had the idea that maybe we could charge folks to come to a um, uh, to come to a class here at the church, and legitimately charge them because we're we're going to tell them it's a fundraiser and they'll be happy to well hopefully they'll be happy to pay. And I've since had maybe six or eight cl classes over at that church, and we have a great time. Um, and my first class was to um, um, Oh, my wife will kill me if I don't remember the name of the club. I call them the Over the Hill Gang, but she has a much more respectful name for that club, so we'll leave it at that. But that's how it started, and I uh, began to uh, teach them, and I began to work in some libraries and uh, some social centers. Um, uh, I worked. Uh, I did a class at the what's it's it's a historical and cultural center that's not too far from here, um, and uh, that has been for me has been terribly rewarding. Uh, and in, in one case in particular, I got a couple of stories I'll tell you real quick. I had one, uh, well I usually do five weeks, five sessions over a five week period. And this particular uh, venue they wanted us to do, they wanted me to do six weeks so I had to find some other subject to cover in that sixth week. So I figured, well I know enough about DNA to be dangerous. I mean at least I can spell it and maybe I can explain it to some folks what DNA was all about. So. I um I did a I did a night on DNA and there's about 40 people in the room and after of course people come up and mill around and they asking questions and this and that and uh, this one woman middle-aged woman came up with a fellow that I assumed was her husband turns out it was she's got tears in her eyes oh my God I'm thinking to myself what did I say I must I'm gonna have to I don't know what I did but I'm gonna have to apologize to her listen to her story. And I said to her, after everybody else kind of left, I said, here, why don't you just sit down right here? And I said, uh, what can I do to help you? What, what's, what seems to be the problem? She said, well, last week my brother's body was found in his apartment. And the ME won't release, the medical examiner won't release him to me so I can give him a proper burial. We have no medical records. We have no dental records. We don't have fingerprints. We don't have anything. So I'm hoping uh, that... You can, answer, you can help me figure out how we can do some DNA tests to prove that this fellow, that, that my brother is my brother. So I, you know, I explained to her, well, she already knew, I just got through explaining about mtDNA and, you know, mitochondrial and Y-DNA and all the rest. So I asked if she had a, a living brother. She did. So I said, well, you need to get a, you know, some tissue from uh, your deceased brother and get a, a swab from your living brother. And uh, if the Y-DNA matches, then there you go. It's uh, that solves the riddle, um, and she did call me or emailed me a few weeks later, and they didn't have to go through the DNA, thank God, because that would have taken even longer. Uh, but she did finally was able to uh, uh, have a have a good uh, a mass, a celebration of her brother's life, and a proper burial, and she was just thrilled to death, um, and and very pleased that uh, that it all came together. So that's my dramatic story. The 170,000 is my happy story. The the brother that was found in his apartment is kind of my sad story. But um, all sorts of other things, and it's particularly interesting doing the client work, um, because I find out things that the clients don't even know. For example. Uh, a woman came to me, very peculiar name, and um, um, I didn't really recognize it at first, but it turns out it's a, um, um, a, a Russian or Ukrainian name. And her dad was a relatively famous pediatrician, but he was an only child. And the only things he told, his, he told her, now she's in her 70s now and I'm doing this work for her, he told her that uh, his, grand, his parents had escaped from Russia in the early 20th century and uh, he said his grandfather had been uh, uh, accused of shooting someone and they ran into the over to this country and the, then a sister of theirs came over and she ended up going to medical school. She became a very um, uh, famous uh, pediatrician. 
uh, as well, and she financed her dad's medical uh, 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 education. And that's not all that she knew, but that's pretty much the extent of what she knew. So I went ahead and got started, and I dug in, and I'm going through you know all sorts of different records and sources and files. And I did find. Uh, are you folks familiar with Find a Grave? I don't know if you have that out. Uh, okay, so you are. Okay, good. So I, I went on to find a grave and couldn't turn anything up there, but I did find the grave of her great grandparents, and I showed her the picture. I said, "Gee, you know," after I was giving her her, her uh, my client report for her. So I showed her the picture. I said, "See, look, I found your great grandparents," and she saw all the Jewish emblems on the the stone at the entrance, and she said, "That's a Jewish cemetery." And I was taken aback because I thought she knew she was Jewish. And I said, well, yeah. I said, your ancestors were Jewish. Oh, my God, she said. She had no idea. Here she's 70-some-odd years old and had never known that. And the reason is her father was a bit of an agnostic. Uh, religion and spirituality were not even an issue for him, believe it or not. And so she just she got the news from me that... Um, that she had uh, Jewish heritage. Now, we got to talking about her family and where people were from and what they did and all, and she said, she said, I knew that they were aristocrats of some type, but they all ended up, uh, some of them escaped to the United States. She said, I don't really know what the story is there. I said, well, um, uh, did you see Dr. Zhivago? She said, yeah. I said, well, that's pretty much based on the truth. She said, all the aristocrats uh, were taken out of their estates, and they all ended up living in slums, and a lot of them escaped Russia altogether, and it sounds like that's the category that your family falls in. Um, not only were they aristocrats, but they were Jewish, so their lives were in danger. So they escaped to the United States, and uh, thank God they did, because that puts you here in front of me. So um, that was a pretty good story for her, and she got a big kick out of it. And I made, um, I think I made a total of three books for her, uh, one for herself, and she wanted to give one to each of her two brothers. She said, wait till they find out they're Jewish. And I said, <laughs> I said make sure you just give them the documentation so we can prove that what I'm saying is, uh, is, uh, is accurate. But uh, we solved a lot of her mysteries about this aunt that had uh, financed her dad's medical um, uh, uh, education. Turns out she was married to a, um, well, it, it's a very long story, but she had some very, very wealthy, very famous um, uh, ancestors that she knew nothing about until we got into this research. And I got her uh, pictures of immigration records and, and uh, ships manifests and census records and birth, marriage, deaths, uh, pictures of places where they lived in New York City. Um, she was uh, pretty much overwhelmed. Uh, with all of this business, but she was tr tickled to death. She's gone away for the winter. She, when she comes back, she says she wants to dig into some, some more things. So I'm going to welcome her when she, uh, when she gets back. But back to the classes. Um, uh, it, it, it's um, it, usually, like I said, I do four sessions or five sessions, and it's a great mixture of people that come in. I get young folks, and I get middle-aged folks, and I get older folks. Um, some of them have been researching their family for years and going down the rabbit hole and not being able to find their way back out, uh, or people that don't even that haven't even started yet, and um, uh, and, and I'm, I'm able to uh, keep those people interested and answer their questions. Thank goodness uh, I can answer their questions and uh, and point them in the right direction. And once in a while, like this woman that uh, that I was just uh, telling her story. Uh, some of these clients come right out of the classes that I conduct, and uh, um, and I enjoy doing that work as well. But not, like I said earlier, nothing makes me happier than to have someone come to me with some kind of, kind of a problem, good or bad, and to be able to resolve it for them. Um, and that gives me a lot of uh, um, satisfaction, a great deal of satisfaction. My story, of course, was hidden from me, and actually when I... <laughs> did all the research, I kind of find out why it was hidden, but my parents have been gone for a while, so they have, and they really had nothing to be ashamed of themselves, but there were some, you know, some things hiding in the closet. Uh, no criminals, which is too bad, because criminals are the easiest people to research. There's all kinds of newspaper articles, and there's uh, criminal records, and, <laughs> and court records, but I don't have any criminals. As a matter of fact, I'll, this is pretty interesting. My dad had a half-brother 
And all I knew that it was his name was Michael. And we're up in Massachusetts, of course. Michael's down in Alabama. And my father used to call him once a year at Christmas. And as I have since found out, there was a uh, eight or nine year gap in their ages because my dad was a product of his father's first marriage and Michael was the first son of his father's second marriage. And I guess my dad had sort of had Michael under his wing until he went into this, uh, to, the, to the service in World War II. But Michael died in a car accident and uh, it was very dramatic for my dad and he was very upset but he still didn't even tell me that Michael was my uncle. Uh, it, everything stayed uh, stayed inside him. He never, he never t tipped his hand on any of this business. So when I finally went to Alabama and I started asking around about the Robison family, as they pronounce it down in Alabama, turns out um, there's quite a few of them down there. I have uh, uh, Michael, uh, of course, was, was my half-uncle, and there were three other half-uncles and a half-aunt, and I've communicated with most of them over the years since I've discovered them. But the curious thing about Michael is he was in a, um, he had just managed to get his uh, doctorate. He was, a, he was a doctor, but he was working at Duke University down, in, uh, down south in a laboratory where they were studying the new science of DNA. So my half-uncle um, was very involved, and, my, and, and just recently I reminded uh, a, a relative down there that I'm still waiting for some information on exactly what he did and what his level of uh, involvement was, and she's promised to get that to me here uh, within the next couple of weeks, and I'll be happy to share that with you. Anyway, um, I've been gabbing away for uh, a long time. Uh, Fiona, is there any questions out there, or do you have any questions, or Chris? Well, actually, I'm glad you asked because I couldn't get a word in. I just said to Chris, oh, I can't get a word in. And she goes, Dave's good. No, we just let it go. Um, well, you, well, you set me loose, Fiona. You said you just take a ball and run with it. No. I know. I know. And, and look, I thank you for that. That's fantastic. And it's interesting that you say that you started doing your family history with the actual software program, Family Tree Maker. Mm -hmm. I started doing it the old-fashioned way with paper and pen and when Family Tree Maker came out I actually purchased it and I've had it ever since mm. and um, my husband just recently said well do you need to buy any more software don't you have enough <laughs> and I said um, well, as a professional, I actually need the latest and the greatest so yeah, no yeah. I'll, I'll be buying more yeah. but anyway yeah. No, he's and he's okay with that. Um, and we've got quite a few viewers, and we've had Kristen came in and um, she couldn't stay, so uh, well, that's okay. Um, it will be replayed. So for everyone watching, there is a YouTube uh, link which I've posted on the events page, so you should find that quite useful. Now that's been fantastic, Dave. Chris, do you have any questions for Dave? Oh, um, thanks, Fiona. Um, Dave, that's uh, really fascinating uh, what you've told us already. But I, I was wondering, um, have you done any studies and uh, received any qualifications? That, do you feel that's really necessary for you to be a professional genealogist? Well, I think the uh, post-nominals are important because other people might be impressed with them. Um, and I don't mean to, to, to belittle them at all, but if I had CG after my name, Certified Genealogist, I would be proud of that accomplishment. And I'm certainly on the road to CG one of these days, Certified Genealogist. Uh, but I have taken the Boston University uh, uh, certificate in genealogical studies, I think is what they call it. That was a fairly intense uh, program. And I've been just too darn busy to get involved with ProGen or any of those others, but um, I do enjoy um, uh, those those programs. As a matter of fact, I've got my laptop kind of propped up, uh, and it, underneath my laptop is Dr. Thomas Jones' Mastering Genealogical Proof. Uh, that, <laughs> that was quite a quite a uh, publication by Tom Jones and I belong to a couple of study groups that we discussed that in at length for weeks on end and of course I spend a lot of time online in, in uh, uh, well you know with Mondays with Mert as that's where I met Fiona and uh, and with other folks like Fiona who are uh, far more knowledgeable than I am and far more experienced 
Um, uh, and I learn a lot from those folks. And uh, uh, I run two Facebook page. Well, I run one Facebook page on genealogy, uh, and uh, I co-administer another uh, with a friend of mine, Bruce Cordes. So he co-administers mine. It's uh, Find a Grave Genealogy Discussion, and his is, oh, I always forget it exactly what it is, Genealogy, Improving Your Searches. And I learn a lot from there because people ask questions, and if I don't have the answer, I try to get them the answer and then post it back. And again, it's that same mode that I'm in all the time of trying to help people um, with their their questions and their problems and try to help them solve uh, the mysteries of their backgrounds. Great, thanks. It's an interesting point you make, uh, Dave, about qualifications, and I've really grappled with that for the last 30 years and I've decided I'm not going to go for any qualifications but I don't think that makes me a lesser um, genealogist but it might make a difference to someone if they want to employ me <laughs> but you know I figure no, it, it doesn't it doesn't worry me, that, and well, I'm I, okay with that. And I'm building a, 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 a pretty respectable resume, if I have to say so myself. I'm, I'm the treasurer of the local genealogical society. I'm the vice president of the New England chapter of the American, excuse me, the Association of Professional Genealogists, and I'm this and I'm that, and I've got all this stuff. Um, and, and I, you know, maybe I just decided, based on what you just said, that I'm not going to bother with CG, perhaps. But, um, but you know how people are. They think, well... You know, is he a doctor? Well, no, I'm not a doctor, but I know how to do stuff. <laughs> so, um, um, and and I'm glad to hear you say that, Fiona, because uh, I'm also torn over those issues uh, very often. I have the greatest respect for people that have done the studies, and um, I learn from them and uh, with them. And I, uh, I feel that um, that's one way to get qualifications. Another way is to uh, do the work, and I've done the work. And um, I've got stories very similar to yours, Dave, and perhaps one day I should just tell my own story and mm -hmm. not have a guest speaker. But... Um, you know, it, it just seems that um, everyone has a story uh, and, and I think that's the whole point. Um, history is his story and um, I make a big point of that, that um, I'm trying to get people to tell their story and it may not be the traditional methods that they use, it may not be by recording uh, facts and figures and it may not be citing resources. It might just be them sitting down and telling the story. And I think as a genealogist, it doesn't really matter how it happens, just that it happens. And I think one of the greatest stories that we overlook, sorry, my voice is going, um, one of the greatest stories we overlook is our own story. And I'm guilty of that myself. And I'm making an effort now to actually make sure that I record my story as well that's as everyone right. else's stories. Yeah. I, I mentioned um, Aunt Sarah. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, that's that's fine. I, I, I um, mentioned Aunt Sarah earlier, this. and I brought a digital recorder. Now, I'm talking 10 years ago, and I put it on the kitchen table, and she said, what's that thing? I said, oh, don't worry about it. I said, I'm going to record our conversation. And she says, well, turn it over because I don't like that red light blinking, which I did. And once you get, they get used to it, I mean, I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't stop this woman. I asked her one question, and she went, like me, she went on and on and on. And I got her story. I've got a, a number of other of my uh, uh, ancestors who, who have all since died, and I'm so glad that I got these stories taped, and I can transcribe them. Um, and some of these people told me some great things. Aunt Sarah admitted to me, and I, I to this day I believe I'm the first one she admitted this to. She's the one that painted the neighbor's cat blue when she was seven years old. Her sister was blamed for it, but she admitted to me that it was her. So she got that off her conscience 80 years later. <laughs> but I teach a, I, one of my classes is all about interviewing your ancestors, jogging memories or something. I forget what I call it. But one of the things I do express, Fiona, is like you just said, is if, there, if you run out of people to interview in your family, well, interview yourself. You know, get a video camera and a, and a recorder and tell your story because your children may not appreciate it now, 
but they will, and their grandchildren, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I know I, I make these family books every time there's a birth or somebody graduates from college or high school or whatever. I'll give them this book. And they say, oh, thanks. <laughs> and they just put it away, and who knows when they'll ever look at it again, but it doesn't matter to me. They've got it, and that's, that's what I wanted. I wanted them to have their own story. Yeah, I think that's important. What about you, Chris? How do you feel about that? And sorry, we didn't introduce Chris before, so Chris, please introduce yourself and tell everyone where you're from. Oh, <laughs> thanks, Fiona. Um, my name's Chris. Um, I live in Rockhampton in central Queensland in Australia, and um, I'm also a researcher of 30-odd uh, years, um, and I haven't... Um, haven't actually really done very much for other people. Um, I'm st still working hard on my own <laughs> genealogy, um, and it's it's really not. Um, well, it's more because as I keep going, I keep finding more information that leads to more information. So you know, it's one of those things. My husband uh, says to me, um, "Aren't you finished yet?" <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think everyone would, uh, who is sincere about genealogy, would realise that um, you know your family history is never finished um, because there's always more stories. So um, I, I love the story aspect and. And um, I, I'm myself. I'm happy to have uh, transcribed some uh, some stories from people who are no longer here, and um, and and that was what uh, started me with my blog. I haven't done many um, public publications on it yet, but um, they're gradually I'm built, working on it, working on it. So, um, but I, I was very interested in in Dave's story because um, I also um, co-present uh, courses for our local Family History Society, which is Central Queensland Family History Society, and um, I have done talks, lots and lots of talks, uh, about various topics, so uh, I guess one day when I retire, perhaps I might think about um, going in that direction, so, you know, I, I, I was really interested in whether both of you thought that the getting some sort of qualification was important, but um, I guess really the, the the letters after your name are only important for people who don't know you. So if there's somebody who who knows you, they already have a good feeling for um, how good you are at research, etc. And um, I guess one of the best ways of advertising yourself is by word of mouth. So those people will tell other people, will tell other people. And um, you know, if you are looking at doing it uh, professionally, then uh, I guess that's a really good way of doing it. So you know, good on you for for looking at it from that uh, from that that way. I agree with you, Chris, that uh, your reputation will carry you much farther than a couple of letters after your name. Um, uh, just a quick thing that, it, that was pretty pretty interesting to me. I, I got my uh, picture and, and a story about me in the paper. I don't know how it managed to do it, but I did. And, and um, um, uh, the first thing that they quoted was something that I had said in the class, and it had to do with the criminal thing. And I said, you know, the best the, the ancestors to have is a criminal, and I expounded on that a little bit, and they put that in the newspaper. That was the opening line. Well, thank you very much. But at any rate, a couple of weeks later, I was in a store, a grocery store, and somebody recognized me. Aren't you the guy that was... Yeah. You know, do you want my autograph? I was teasing him a little bit. <laughs> but to be recognized for that, I mean, that just that made me feel good. And uh, um, and I don't have a, B, a CG after my name, but it, uh, I was recognized <laughs> for whatever that's worth. It, it may actually be that um, sometimes some people see um, uh, people who have qualifications and have the letters after their name as um, a bit overwhelming to them. So it, it may be a better approach for this sort of community, I think. Mm. I think it's a, a very personal thing and I think people, when they um, look for someone if they want something done for them, that it's 
whether you know, like and trust the person and I think that's really important and that's probably one of the reasons why I'm doing the Hangouts so that I've mm. got this library of information that people can go and have a look at and decide whether or not they want me to uh, be involved in their research or um, help instruct them and guide them and lead them down the path that they may never return from because <laughs> once you once you're bitten that's it it's um it, re it generally is genealogy it's um certainly something that I'll probably never finish and um I think I'm okay with that now but it's taken a long time I'm a very slow learner but um I I think also uh Chris that um, if you haven't done work for other people, it doesn't matter. Um, the work for other people really broadens your horizons. It um, takes you down paths that you don't normally go down um, or it can take you down a path that you're very familiar with. I've done a lot of research for someone whose ancestors come from Cornwall and they come from a village just down the road around the corner from where my ancestors come from. And um, when I started doing her research, it was just easy, it wasn't hard for me and I came up with all this information. She said, where did you get this from? And I said, well, I happen to be, you know, descendant from people down the road, around the corner and um, I know quite a bit about where they came from and what they did and um, that was great. It was having that knowledge and um, being able to share it as well was um, very important and I think I found that when I hit my brick walls is when I started looking to help other people and, and people would just ask anyway and uh, my mother was a good one. She dobbed me in for many jobs that I did. Oh, my, daughter's a, my daughter can help you with that and mm -hmm. um, I, I must admit I did get quite a few friends from that and I'm very grateful so thanks mum but um, yeah, it's, um, it's just something that yeah, sometimes you fall into and sometimes you don't and um, I, I think Dave you've had the opportunity to actually go out into the public and, and assist them and do it with them. Um, do, do you think that um, doing, it, doing it for them, doing it with them or showing them how to do it is, is a good option? I believe that there's those three options. Sure, and I just go with the flow. If the uh, person said, can you help me find this or can you help me, what direction should I go in for that, um, I'll tell them that, well, when I'm doing client work, so I get a little bit of a hint in there, I said I would do this and that, so I recommend that you subscribe to this website and you know, uh, use this and use that, and I give them some tools, you know, record everything, make sure you know where you've been so you don't go back over the same thing over and over again, and I'll spend some time, and, and, and many times these people will say, you know, I'm not cut out for this, can you do it for me? Sure, and that goes from there. And, oh, I just want to mention quickly that I got uh, several responses this year for some reason, I don't know why, uh, from a couple of, from around the country that, and I say to them, you know, how is it that you found me? And they said, well, we saw your, your webpage. And I don't know, I managed to get that webpage to climb up in the, in the searches, uh, the Google searches, but it worked. I had a fellow from California, actually, had a very interesting background. His German grandfather came to this country, then they went to Mexico, then they came to Massachusetts, then they went back to Mexico, and then they went to Texas, and he wanted me to help uh, find some of the places where he lived. So I, uh, I got some of the addresses where he lived, where this fellow lived in the early 1900s, and in Springfield, uh, which is the town, well, it's a pretty big town next to where, where I live. The WPA, you know, you folks might, are probably not uh, aware of what that is. It's the Works Pro Progress um, uh, Act, Works Progress Act, WPA. Uh, President Roosevelt had put this together, and basically it's just busy work. Uh, the government funded these people to just do things. Uh, one of the big things that these, pe these folks did was to create the Soundex lists, and Soundex cards, you're familiar with Soundex, I'm, I'm sure. Um, but the other thing they did in Springfield, and this is bizarre, they took a photograph of every single building in Springfield that's residential and commercial, and there's a black and white photograph with a plot plan in a file down at the Department of Public Works. And 
it's the best kept secret in genealogy in this area. And I'm down there all the time. They, they charge me a whole dollar for a photocopy. So I got pictures of this fellow's um, ancestors' um, uh, residences, which I found particularly interesting. But then I went and found the house. The, the, there's uh, three, three of the four are still standing. So I got pictures of those. And I was able to send him the before and after kind of pictures, uh, which which seemed to be what his target was, was to find information out about um, um, uh, the real estate that this fellow had been involved in. It was difficult because uh, in the late 30s, or the early 30s, uh, at the time of the Great Depression here in the United States, there were thousands of people who lost their homes due to the, uh, due to the Depression. And it was heartbreaking to see people were losing their homes for the sake of $25 in taxes or $15. And the t these residents, these, these uh, properties are being turned over to the uh, city of Springfield. They were claiming them on, uh, for, for the tax lien. It was kind of sad. Thousands of these properties. And that made it difficult to find the things that I was looking for. But anyway, I don't even know how I got off on that tangent. Are you with us? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah it's you all look good. like you're having. <laughs> looks like something's melting down on you there. Um, no, no, it's all good. I've got two oh, event pages, okay. so, you know, okay. it's just um, <laughs> Google and when I go in and I do something and it doesn't do what I expect it to, so I end up with two event pages and I just realised that some of them don't have the links, so I'm just putting the links there. Oh. But no, it's all good. It's all fine. Um, Chris. Yes, Fiona. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, with your experience in genealogy, would you actively um, seek the opportunity to do work for someone else? Because if someone here wanted to know something about the Rockhampton area, would they be able to contact you and ask you to do some research for them? Well, not at this stage. I'm, um, okay. I work full time and uh, yeah, I just really, it, the main reason I haven't ever done any is because I've just been too busy and it, it's not that people haven't asked me to help. Normally um, at this stage what I do is pass people on to somebody else who I know will be able to help them and um, <clears throat> mostly for people who are interested in, uh, in this region uh, it's a matter of contacting uh, the Central Queensland Family History Association and um, our society does offer uh, research in exchange for money um, of local resources and um, the, the uh, ladies who do that, they do it on a volunteer basis because it is a fundraising activity for our society and um, they do a fabulous job, um, you know, finding out things, amazing things for people and um, and then one of the really wonderful things they do is that when we have our meetings uh, they will give a bit of an overview of some of the research that they've been doing for people who've uh, contacted them and um, there's been a couple of times where I have recognised that story and that has been something to do with my family. So even though my family are not from Rockhampton. So, <laughs> you know, um, that spreading of the, of the word <laughs> is just wonderful, just wonderful. So uh, certainly, you know, I don't mind people contacting me, um, but I would generally not be able to really help them unless it was something to do with my family, but I can certainly put them onto the somebody who will um, will be able to help them in in some respect so yeah uh, that, that that's how I work it at the moment <laughs> I understand that I work full-time myself and um, yeah I do research pretty well full-time as well so um, it's it's tough work and um, I can appreciate that and you've made a really 
good point that we haven't really covered in this conversation and that is joining a society or a group of like-minded people because they can be very, very useful. I'm a life member of the Genealogical Society of Victoria and my number is uh, pretty low and um, I'm sure most people would look at me and, and say, you can't possibly be a life member but um, I've been a life member for 27 years so there you go. Um, and Dave, you've obviously found that quite useful because you're involved in groups as you mentioned so I think it's important that people do understand that even if they don't want to do the research themselves they can get involved in a group of um, similar interests and like Chris is involved in a, a a particular area but it's not where her family come from and, and yet she still found information so it can well, be very useful. I like to say that you don't know what you don't know and until you get into uh, t starting to talk to your peers and you find out that they've done research in this area or that area that you never even thought of and uh, you know you go off on another tangent but um, uh, with regards to one of the organizations there that uh, it's called the Western Massachusetts Genealogical Society we meet once a month and I'll probably ask Fiona to come and meet with us uh, on a hangout uh, one of these days but every, uh, two, two, two days a month we offer a clinic and we offer the, our members the opportunity to come to the clinic and uh, we help them and guide them doing their research uh, and again that comes from the uh, the fact that we all like to help people uh, in their searches. So with the, with the uh, there's a there's a senior center that's a fairly new building with a beautiful uh, uh, computer room. There's a 16 uh, uh, computers in there, I believe, and we fill the room with people, and they just go to town. And when they get stuck, we go over and help them out, and we point them in this direction or that direction, and it's uh, we have a good time, have some fun. Yep. And I think that's what it's all about is having fun and um, it can seem like really hard work at times and I think that's part of the reason why I went off and did work for other people. I get a little bit stuck with my own and not get anywhere and I always like to move forward. It's something that I, I don't like to sort of go back and have to um, redo things all the time even though sometimes you have to. And um, I think that's part of the reason that I got so involved in it and um, ended up realising that I just absolutely loved it, just like Dave. And I think if you can find um, a soulmate in genealogy, then you're doing really well. So thank you, Dave. Um, he's become my fan. I've become his fan. <laughs> Chris, I think you're you're pretty marvellous too, doing a full-time job and research as well and a blog. And um, I certainly tried... I have a blog, but do I blog? Probably not. Uh, the reality is, no, I, I probably don't. But I, um, you know, I probably have the intention to do a, a bit more. So, so Chris, keep going. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, if, if you do go to my blog, you'll see that I've only had two posts so far, but uh, that is because I also look after the web pages for two two different societies, and uh, I look after the computers for the for the local one. And I honestly just don't have enough time in my day. Um, <laughs> so, I know, yeah. but it's all good. It's all good. I was yes, I was very I was very well intentioned last year. I have a a little. A, a little um, diary that my grandfather had kept in 1913. He entered something, he blogged, <laughs> and he, he entered something every single day. And I tell people that it's excruciatingly boring to, re <laughs> to read this diary. We cut down a tree, we caught some fish, we put in a this. I mean, it's just not very great. But my intentions were to blog a page of that on the 100th anniversary of that page, and I just lost track of it and never f finished it up. But to uh, to the blog, I mean, I'm pretty reasonably, well, what can I put it, maybe three or four times a week I'll get a blog out there. And just so that you know, you, uh, you, well, at least mine anyway, it, it connects to Twitter, it connects to Tumblr, it connects to Facebook, It can, I mean, it connects all over the place. Um, uh, and that's, I just keep blogging away and getting my name out there. 
Yes, I must admit my, mine uh, connected. My Google Plus filters through to Facebook, filters through to Twitter, yeah. and I get these comments on LinkedIn, and people say, "Oh, I love that post," and I'm thinking, "What post?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh dear. Um, but yeah, that's that's how you get away with it. You get things to filter through, and it's a, a very good trick that I've I've learnt in internet marketing. But anyway, um, is if anyone's got any questions, I've been checking the um, event pages, but I can't hear or see anything. So um, I think we've had a pretty good time. Well, I know I've had a great time. What about you, Chris? Have you had a good oh, time? Oh, yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm really interested in asking people to what they're interested in seeing on um, a genealogy hangout. Um, it's just something that I've got ideas and um, I've got people lined up um, and not to take anything away from you Dave, it's been fantastic this week, really, really good. But next week I have a professional organiser, a certified organiser who's been on Oprah and if that doesn't drive people to this hangout, I don't know what will, but um, Kathy Burns is a fantastic person. I met her when I was in Oceanside not long after I finished at Roots Tech and um, she has graciously uh, agreed to come on to the hangout and offer some clues and ideas about getting organised and I think that might be really, really useful. Don't know about anyone else but you can see in the background there I've got piles <laughs> of, of paper um, and I think that's the one thing that I really don't like. Um, collecting these piles and, and I really need to get more organised. But I'm a bit like Chris. Um, well, that's why I have these sure drapes. That's why I have time. these drapes back here. All the piles are behind the drapes. This is my little studio. <laughs> but I, I can't believe that you're talking going to this thing on organisation because I've got Mert coming in a hangout to my Western Mass Genealogy Society to talk about. Her title is "The Winter of Our Discontent: How to Get Organised in Three Months." And um, I'm going to pay well, very quickly, and I'm go. obviously going to watch your hangout as well. But uh, that's the bane of my existence right now is piles everywhere here. Uh, yeah, look, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm covering most of them, um, but there's one pile there I noticed that I didn't cover. And I normally have my, um, my room divider out, <laughs> but it's just been a bit crowded and I just haven't done it. So yeah, there's, there's one pile there. Um, and lots of pot. And look, I can see Chris is very organised in her. Oh, I, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm looking at those. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, that's organised, yeah, Chris. Yeah. You you can you can see that. That's good. But um, you, what you can't see is the other piles that are not in view. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's I think that's a, a unanimous decision that we've all got piles and not the medical type but the paper type of piles but I also think it's really important to um, have someone like Kathy come on and talk about the, the other bits and pieces that you collect along the way it's not just the sheets of paper and um, I confess in the 40 and I've just passed my anniversary um, in the 44 years that I've been researching I have not thrown out one piece of paper <laughs> And I have to actually, yeah, really, really make a concerted effort and get rid of some of the stuff because I know I'm not going to go back to it anymore. But I've always felt that I, I couldn't get rid of it just in case I missed something. And I tend to go over my research again and again and again and not because I'm bored or anything like that but because all the uh, resources that have been available in the time that I've been researching have changed so dramatically that I tend to go back and revisit and I make a point of that. But um, yeah, I, I think we've had a fantastic hangout. Um, we've had some uh, huge numbers in viewers along the way, so thank you 
uh, everyone who's popped in and had a look and I do apologise that I didn't have the YouTube posting initially when we started. Um, I had it posted on one page but not the other so there you go. Uh, lots to learn on Hangouts even when you've been doing it for as long as I have and you've done as many um, because it changes all the time. Uh, you tend to forget to copy and paste and, and put instructions into one box and not the other. So I'm going to head off for a cup of coffee now and I'm going to say thank you to everyone. Thank you Dave and um, I hope you will come back again and talk to us. As well, I want to say I want to say it was a delight to meet you Chris uh, because Fiona and I have been very close friends now for pretty close to two weeks and now I have another friend in Australia. Absolutely. So very nice to be here. <laughs> It's, it's always good to make new friends and that's what we try and do on Genealogy Hangout and uh, make connections across the world and uh, all my best friends are in other countries as, as well, I mean I've got good friends in Australia but I've also got fantastic friends in the UK, in Germany and um, in America and uh, Dave is my BFF and <laughs> I'm <laughs> very, very lucky and I wasn't being rude. And uh, Chris, thank you very much for uh, jumping in onto the Hangout and participating. I really do appreciate it. And we're going to sign off now and uh, I'm going to stop the broadcast and I'll look forward to seeing you all next week. So cheers for now. Bye. Bye. <laughs>